Welcome to AWS 53. Uh, today's presentation, this uh, one on Willamette Wines is gonna be brought to you by Jim Bernal, a longtime friend of the American Wine Society. Jim's introduction to wine was made by the first emigrating winemaker to Oregon since Prohibition. UC Davis graduate Richard Summer, who believed it was Oregon, not California, where he would grow world-class Pinot Noir and who needed a lawyer to obtain the necessary licenses the state hadn't issued in more than 30 years. Richard drove his pickup into the small town of Roseburg to find himself a lawyer and hired Jim's father. In 1981, Jim began searching for vineyard land and found an overgrown pioneer plum orchard in the Salem Hills. In 1983, he began planting Pinot Noir, watering his wines with 17 lengths of 75 foot garden hose, which is not typically how it's done. While the vines grew, Jim concentrated on helping Oregon winemakers by passing legislation on making wineries a permitted use of farmland, uh, the direct shipment of wine, wine tasting in stores and restaurants, and later the establishment of the Oregon Wine Board. His fellow winemakers have recognized Jim's early work with the industry's founder award, followed by the governor's goal presented by Oregon's four living governors. In 1988, Jim conducted the first crowdfunding in the nation to build his winery by obtaining permission from the Securities and Exchange Commission in 1988, paving the way for community-based funding for small businesses. Willamette Valley Vineyards has grown to over 17,000 wine enthusiast owners and is listed on the NASDAQ under the symbol WVVI and WVVIP. Jim believes that Pinot Noir made with consideration for the environment, employees and community simply tastes better. With that purpose, Willamette Valley Vineyards and Jim Bernal have been recognized for environmentally responsible wine growing by LIV, which stands for Low Impact Viticulture and Enology, and Salmon Safe, as well as receiving the Sustainable Standard Setter Award from the Rainforest Alliance for their use of FSD certified cork. In 2014, Jim was honored with the Los Eros del Salud Award for his contributions in providing health care to Oregon's vineyard workers. These accomplishments have led to Willamette Valley Vineyards being listed among the top 100 wines in the world by Wine Spectator Magazine, named one of America's great Pinot Noir producers by Wine Enthusiast Magazine, and Winery of the Year by Wine and Spirits Magazine. More recently, in 2019, Jim Bernal and Justin King of the King Estates Winery accepted the Innovator of the Year Award at the Wine Enthusiast Wine Star Awards for Oregon Solidarity a collaboration wine to support Rogue Valley wineries and wine growers whose contracts were abruptly canceled. If you ask Jim where his favorite places are to be, he will tell you in the vineyard or hiking the Cascade Trail with his wife, Jan. Now, please join me in welcoming Jim Bernal. Aaron, thank you very much for that introduction. It's wonderful to be back uh, with you again, uh, even if it's through uh, Zoom. You know, I, um, I wanted you to know that um, I really appreciate uh, the help I'm receiving today. Uh, Dana Fritsch um, is from our staff and she's uh, watching your comments, uh, reading on, in the chat about your questions. And uh, she's going to be helping me make sure that I answer your questions because, um, you know, the, I may not be able to make it out uh, while I'm present your, com your questions in the chat, but I do encourage you to send me your questions in the chat and I will uh, in, at, at any time during this presentation and I'll endeavor uh, to answer them as we move through these subjects of this presentation. I also wanna thank uh, Diane uh, and Katie for um, also making this possible from the AWS side. You know, I really have enjoyed uh, being on Zooms with you with the chapters over this kind of Zoom year that we're in. And, um, and on those calls, because of the group size, I was able to see you and wave at you. And, and I know because of the size of this, we can't do that. Uh, but um, uh, I do look forward to seeing you again, right there on that deck um, at, the, at Willamette Valley Vineyards at the Estate Winery that you can see here in this image. Um, so I, I'm hoping soon we'll be able to meet again in person. You know, I know that uh, on the Zooms I've been on, um, also on this Zoom, 
uh, Carl uh, Starkloff is on this uh, in this Zoom, and I and he's one of our owners, um, and of course a devoted AWS member, as was uh, his uh, late wife or now late wife Judy. And I wanted to add my congratulations uh, to Carl for uh, the award of merit that she has received from the AWS Educational Foundation for her work. Um, you know, you you look at the the what AWS has accomplished. It is the preeminent uh, wine enthusiast organization in the United States. And it's that way because of its leadership and because of um, the remarkable dedication of the people who continue to contribute to make ADF, AWS possible year after year. So I'd really like to acknowledge um, their remarkable uh, support for telling the story of wine uh, to American wine consumers and to the wine trade. You know, the, um, uh, this, uh, we're gonna go through this presentation and I'm gonna uh, prompt Katie to uh, you know, change these slides. So she's gonna drive the slideshow. Uh, but I wanted to uh, let you know that I know you have wine in front of you. We've got three wines that we're gonna get to enjoy as we go through these slides and hear a little bit about the Oregon wine story. Now, there's so much to the story, I can't tell it all to you, but I'm going to tell you a, the story of the pioneers and how that, how that, uh, those innovations and the achievements that have occurred from these um, pioneers, these kind of Oregon wine pioneers, has led to the success that Oregon is enjoying today. But so please open up those bottles, start with the Chardonnay, and, um, and make sure that you're tasting along with me. Um, so, so anyway, the, um, uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is Dana is, uh, Rich is going to be including in the chat a box a uh, order form uh, for the wines that will be um, that will be tasting today, and uh, and as well uh, you can access the Willamette Valley Vineyard website uh, to choose any other wines you may choose. And so today, this day only, uh, you will be able to be uh, act like you're a winery owner receiving the owner's discount today if you uh, decide to uh, choose any of these wines to be shipped to you. You know, this uh, the wines we're tasting today um, are of the 2017 vintage. And I thought it'd be best for me to, to tell you a little bit about that vintage as you're getting those wines ready to taste uh, as we go through this presentation. Um, the 2017 vintage uh, like you know, every vintage in Oregon and the Willamette Valley as well is is different, but in this particular year, we the the flowering started uh, in 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 the valley with very warm weather, which really prompted the vines to 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 flower, and then what happened was we went through a cool down period during that flowering period, and this is one thing that you that uh, that may not be known to some of you that believe it or not, that the warmer it gets, actually warmth because of these, the sensitivity, the remarkable fragility of especially uh, Pinot Noir, cool climate Pinot Noir, can actually adversely affect bloom if it gets too warm. And so the cool down period actually enhanced bloom. And, and then, uh, so we got this actually really quite a nice uh, fruit set in, in this vintage year. And, and then what happened in August, as you know, during the time of Raison, um, we had the warmest August on a record. And, and, um, and then uh, that kind of accelerated, right, that Raison uh, period. And then the thing that happened was quite unexpected. We went through a, a cool down. And so what happened was something you as wine enthusiasts will love to know, and you'll taste it in these wines. They have a slightly higher ripeness, so they're slightly higher uh, sugar levels that came out of the fruit, and but also elevated acid levels, or so more liveliness as well. And whenever you get the combination of those two, you know you've got accentuated, uh, 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 you know, quality, accentuated aromas and flavors, and a well-balanced wine that has a long life. So please start enjoying those wines now. Can you show the next slide? Now here you can see some of our founders and you heard already uh, from Aaron about Richard Summer and how, the influence that he had on me. He's Oregon's very first 
a uh, vinifera winemaker, bringing up vinifera vines, including Pinot Noir for the first time to Oregon in the late 1950s. And um, there he is on the far right. And then you can see uh, Bill Fuller, who's uh, standing there. And it's a, a black and white picture as well, um, next to Bill Malkmus, his, his partner, who was essentially a investment banker that backed him. And Bill Fuller was the, the really the first practicing winemaker who actually emigrated from California to Oregon. And um, he, he was the winemaker at Louis Martini Winery in Napa Valley. But he told his boss at Louis Martini, he said, you know, I've got to go to Oregon. I can't make the high quality Pinot Noir here where we are. I've got to go to Oregon where the climate is much better for growing cool climate varieties. And think about this, he packed up his family in 1973, he put his wife and kids in the station wagon and he followed them in a pickup full of cuttings. Just amazing courage. And, and, and so I'll be telling a little bit of the story about him today. Uh, I joined with him, he actually merged with me with Willamette Valley Vineyards in 1997. And then you see Betty O'Brien. Betty O'Brien's the founder of Elton Vineyard. Uh, another one of our industry founders, uh, you know, like our industry founders, they came from modest backgrounds. And Betty was the, uh, she was the head of the Girl Scouts for the Sandy Am chapter, which is essentially the Willamette Valley chapter of the Girl Scouts in Oregon. Her husband, Dick, who I'll have a picture of you a little bit later, was a middle school teacher, planting and growing one of the best vineyards in Oregon. And then you can see me there, uh, you know, training up my vines in 1983. And you can see that red soil, that volcanic rusted red soil in the background. Uh, next slide, Katie. Now here, of course, uh, for a number of you that know our background and our history, you heard the story from Aaron about how unusual we are. Um, you know, we're the very first um, uh, uh, business in the United States uh, to receive the Securities and Exchanges Commission to do something, which is to take ownership from what's called unqualified investors. Now, back at that time, only the only people who could invest in small companies uh, in stock, uh, in equity investment, were what they were called qualified investors. Those are people who could essentially, in the government's eyes, take the loss. And so they, you had to make $250,000 a year back then and have over $2 million in, in uh, equity, not including the equity in your home and furnishings and automobile before you could actually invest in a, a business like mine. And, and so when I told, I said to the government, I said, well, gee, we have lots of wine enthusiasts who wanna be part of the Oregon wine industry, but they're not you know, as wealthy as your, uh, your requirements provide, allow. And, but there was a little known feature in the federal law that allowed us to do a very small self underwritten public offering to allow wine enthusiasts to become owners wine enthusiasts of all backgrounds. And so in this picture, you'll see school teachers, postal workers, uh, police officers, uh, college professors, people from all walks of life uh, here in this photograph. And there you can see our groundbreaking in 1989, which raised the money from our very first stock offering to build Willamette Valley Vineyards. Katie, next slide. Now, while they're looking at this beautiful picture, so imagine yourself up on the deck. And I know a number of you have been on the deck of, of the Willamette Valley Vineyards and looking out over this beautiful scenery. Now you're up, you know, when you're on the deck of Willamette Valley Vineyards, you're like 800 feet in elevation above the valley floor. You can see almost all the way down the valley. And while you're doing that, I would like you to taste that Chardonnay. Now this is called the Bernal Block Chardonnay. And the reason why it's called that is because that's my very first planting of Chardonnay. And it's an unusual Chardonnay in that it, it really comes from a problem we as pioneering winemakers in Oregon were trying to solve. Now remember I told you that the winemakers came up from California to start our industry and they brought their cuttings with them. And we discovered that they, the Chardonnay in particular did not ripen in the cool years of our summers. And so we thought, gee, uh, maybe the vines changed in California over the hundred and some years they were there. Let's ask the French if they will help us. And so we asked their Burgundian winemakers if they would, would send us or they would provide us with cuttings from their Grand Cru vineyards. 
And actually that's what we were able to achieve and that's what we planted in our vineyards. And those are called the Dijon clones. And those, that, that was really, uh, uh, again, some college professors were behind this. Our unsung heroes were our college professors uh, at Oregon State University was a college professor, Heather Bell, and uh, at uh, Dijon University. And of course, with the government agency in France uh, was uh, uh, Dr. Raymond Bernard. And he was doing a study on the, um, identifying the highest quality cool climate varieties in Burgundy. And it, we just caught him just at the right time after he had done his analysis of what the best particular natural occurring clones were of Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. Boy, did we get lucky. And so I'm, as you're tasting that, that uh, Bernal Block Chardonnay, I'm, I'm wondering if we could put up a picture and I don't know if Katie can, but we'll see if she can put up a picture the, of the label of that, um, of that uh, bottle. And I'm just crossing my fingers to see if that's possible. Ah, there it is. That is what you're tasting. And I didn't, wasn't prepared for this because I only found out when I came onto the Zoom that you were tasting out of little bottles. And, um, and so you, you didn't have the benefit of actually seeing the bottle with the label, at least a number of you didn't. And so there it is, that's the image. And so when you, my, for me, and, and of course all of us are different, but for me, I get you know citrus, pear, honey in the aroma. I get uh, in the taste kind of lemon meringue, uh, kind of candy, ginger, a little pineapple. And in the finish, you know, I get this wonderfully long finish uh, that uh, is a little bit of vanilla that picked up from the barrel and some baking spices. And so I was thinking, okay, you know, what do I really enjoy with this wine? Of course, we're all different, but, and so you need to have enough of this wine, of course, uh, to make sure you try it out with various kinds of foods. So try it out with some of my favorites, which is scallops, halibut, uh, crab cakes, um, asparagus risotto, and actually turkey. This is a great wine uh, for, um, for turkey dinner. You can show our next slide, Katie. Did it work? It worked. Thank you. Uh, here we are. This is this is uh, here. You can see me on on your left as you're viewing the the image, and you can see Christine Claire, the person I'm training to replace me when I can no longer serve you as your leader uh, at the winery. And um, so she's actually been in that role for a long time. She's our winery director, and you can see us harvesting Pinot Noir. And if you look right through the tractor, you can see Willamette Valley Vineyards Estate, and this is what we call the Bernal Block. And this is the very first 15 acre planting of Pinot Noir that I did. Uh, also, uh, and we're right in actually uh, the Dijon clones that we uh, got help from um, Robert Drouin, who came from Burgundy to Oregon uh, to plant Pinot Noir. And when he came to Oregon, he said, he said, Jim, he said, you need to get some more clones from Burgundy. You should get the 667 and the 777. And so our industry asked if they would, if the if the French would please send those to us, and they did, and so that's what we're harvesting here, and so that's one of the secrets behind why is it that Oregon Pinot Noir, especially Pinot Noir grown in the Willamette Valley Appalachian, is so remarkable. Next slide, Katie. Now I don't know how many of you had an opportunity to come up and see this vineyard. This is one of Oregon's very first plantings. And so this is actually Northwest of Forest Grove. This is where Bill Fuller went. And he chose this site. Remember back when he came to Oregon, nobody had an idea where the best place was to, to grow Pinot Noir. Of course, now you can drive to Newburgh and you go to Newburgh, between Newburgh and McMinnville, you can find uh, more than a hundred, right? Hundreds actually of wineries clustered around there. But when he came to Oregon, he saw this actually northwest of Forest Grove. He said, this has got to be the best place for me. And so in the distance, you can see the coast range. And the coast range encroaches into the Willamette Valley, the closest in this location, and creates like a little cul-de-sac around this vineyard. And so it, it has like a weather shadow. For any of you who've been in, in, you know, taking the Golden Gate Bridge from San Francisco to Sausalito, you know exactly what I'm talking about when you when you, the Sausalito weather 
It was like, it's like a little banana belt there in Sausalito. And so that's what Bill Fuller discovered here. And, and um, boy, am I lucky that when he decided to retire, he called me on the phone. So uh, um, the, and that's of course the, the, the wine that I wanted to show you, that Pinot Noir. And so I hope you're starting to reach for that bottle here. Next slide, Katie. Now, one of the things that makes this vineyard stand out is its soil. The soil is, is, is unusual. And you can see in my hand, the, they look like dusty, uh, rusted musket balls. And they're called piezolites. And they're made in the soil, uh, literally made in the soil through a process of weatherization and, and their electrical charges and properties that cause them to bind together. Um, and and if, so if you cut one of those, you get a, a knife sharp enough and hard enough, you can cut one of those in half and they look like an onion. Well, there are millions of these in these piezolites in the soil uh, in going down a depth of feet in the soil. And we actually think that that is one of the reasons why the Pinot Noir grown at this particular vineyard has performed so well internationally. Now, so you've got that, um, uh, you've got that. So if you could put the slide up of that bottle, I, I don't know if you've got it, but I hope you do. The Tualatin Estate Pinot Noir, 2017. And, and when you, what I think you're gonna find is it has, it has this uh, elegant frame of, of bright acidity as well as these firm tannins. I think that's what you're gonna find in this vintage. And so this is really something you wanna sell her to get all of its, all of the goodness from it. So for me and my aroma, what I get is I get red cherry, I get orange spice, you know, violets, or sometimes like a little bit of a violet and, and rose, rose petal. And, and uh, that's, that's one of the things I think this soil does produce. And also of course cedar that, you know, of course this barrel, this uh, wine was in barrel. Um, the taste I get is uh, cranberry, raspberry, pumpkin spice, and of course, like all great Willamette Valley uh, Vineyard ADA Pinot Noirs, earthiness. And for pairings, for me, you know what? This is the one I would bring uh, for all of your Pinot Noir drinkers to, to turkey dinner, to Thanksgiving dinner with all the fixins. Uh, also roast chicken. So try that. My wife, um, Jan, uh, she's, uh, she likes uh, 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 duck breast with a, uh, so try this, see if you can get a little pomegranate and citrus glaze on that duck breast and see what this wine does for that. Uh, next slide. You know, um, here in this slide, you're gonna see um, Bill Fuller and he's off to your left in the far left He's now 83 years old and he's still making wine in our cellar, 83 years old. What an amazing man, amazing pioneer of Oregon wine industry. And then, and, and, and here's maybe a couple things that, that might, might just surprise you about his vineyard that he planted and now fortunately is part of Willamette Valley Vineyard. And it's one of the reasons why we, we've done so well is that uh, Bill Fuller with Tualatin was the very first Oregon winemaker to be achieve a top 100 listing in the Wine Spectator, and and um, and you know what might even su surprise you further was it was with a Chardonnay. His Chardonnay uh, was the first Oregon wine to be listed among the top 100. The other thing that's really an amazing thing that we have at the winery, they have pictures too, is that he. Um, he achieved something no winemaker has ever done. And that is uh, he uh, uh, was awarded the best to show for a red wine at the London International Wine Competition and the best of show for white wine in the same year. And of course that was pretty exciting for him to be able to go to England, to London and uh, to be awarded by the court uh, this remarkable award. And in the foreground, you'll see Efren Loeza. Efren Loeza came across the border with his father at a very young age. Of course, he got caught and <laughs> sent back. And he eventually, uh, you know, became, studied and became a U.S. citizen. 
and and he is our vineyard manager. He has been working for Bill for all those years. When we merged with Tualatin, he became our vineyard manager. He now supervises over 500 planted acres of vines. And, and to, the, to the point now, he's contributed so much to our industry. He received the very first industry award for vineyard management uh, from our Oregon wine industry, the very first one. And we're naming a vineyard after him and his family, La Weza Vineyard. We're gonna have a celebration. I'd love, like to have all of you come to it when we get over this, uh, this uh, COVID. Um, because we're going to have a big celebration and have his family come up, even family members from Mexico, to celebrate the naming of this vineyard because of the contribution he and his family have made to our industry. And then, of course, you can see Betty O'Brien there in the pink sheet and what pink shirt. And what we're doing, of course, is we're putting a blend together um, and making notes and, and trying to figure out just how we're going to create a blend from the different vineyards that, uh, that we all have founded. So be looking forward to that wine. Uh, next slide, Katie. Now, some of you have been here. This is Elton Vineyard. This is not actually a wine that you're tasting, but I wanted to show it to you because it is one of Oregon's founding vineyards and it helps tell a story and an important story. So you can see Elton Vineyard there and you can see, if you look really close at the bottom of that big aisle going down the middle of these vine rows, as you can see a big white rock. So Katie, show them the next slide. Here you can see uh, Dick O'Brien, who's, uh, who's passed now. Uh, and, and so actually this headstone of this, of this big white granite rock, which really doesn't belong in the Willamette Valley, uh, but the vineyard was planted around it. Um, here that he's standing next to. And this helps tell part of that remarkable story of why Pinot Noir grown in the Willamette Valley is so extraordinary. But about 16,000 years ago, there was a flood of biblical proportions that came loose from a, the, a glacier that had been blocking uh, the path of a river, uh, the middle fork of the Clark River that had flooded back up into Montana and 500 cubic miles of water, all the um, greater than the flow of all the rivers on, in the world today came gushing out of the top of Idaho, carrying chunks of that glacier with it. And when it did, it floated chunks of that glacier all the way down the Columbia River, all the way up into the Willamette Valley, filling the Willamette Valley up like a bathtub. Imagine that, imagine the water all the way up to uh, Dick O'Brien's feet, uh, where that chunk of that glacier came to rest, carrying a white granite rock from Canada that it broke off of a mountain as it came into the United States. Isn't that amazing? And so you think about the Pinot Noir that's grown here on these, in these slopes. It has the benefit of the topsoil, actually, uh, well, Eastern Washington's best topsoil, uh, and, and creates flavors and aromas in Pinot Noir like no other. So next slide, uh, Katie. Now here, I wanted to take just a little time with this. Um, and let me share here if we can, uh, oh, I have got a couple of questions here. So I'm gonna make sure I answer these, uh, but let me, let me at least describe to you who you're looking at um, while you're getting that other bottle out, okay? So now you're getting out a bottle of a red blend and it's called Mati. And so while you're doing that and tasting that, uh, I'd like you to um, just take a look at these people here. Now you can see me there on the far right and you can see uh, Christine Claire right in the middle. Uh, but I wanna tell you about these remarkable pioneers. And these are pioneers from Walla Walla. So you might be scratching your head and thinking, well, gee, if they're from Walla Walla, Jim, this is an Oregon wine presentation. Well, these are remarkable Walla Walla uh, vintners, but you know where they get their grapes. They get the grapes from the Walla Walla AVA that is uh, part of the northern east part of Oregon. So we're standing in Oregon in this picture. And in the distance at the top of the picture is the town of Walla Walla on the other side of the state line. So on the far left is Marty Club. Now he and his wife own LaCole, uh, Megan, and, and they actually uh, got that winery from 
a, a Megan's parents, Jean and Baker Ferguson. And this, uh, this business that they started was in 1983. The, you know, they started the coal in 1983, both the, the uh, a Megan's parents did. And, and La Cole, of course, as you know, is one of the most remarkable wineries in, 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 uh, in the world, uh, but also well-known, of course, um, and, um, amongst many of you. And, and one of the things I wanted to just share with you about how remarkable this winery is, is that they received the best of show for Bordeaux varietals above 15 pounds per bottle uh, for the 2011 Estate Ferguson Vineyard. And that's from the, that's the uh, 2014 World Wine Awards. So think of that, the best in the world. And, and what I'm here to tell you is that the, the vineyard, the, the, the Estate Ferguson Vineyard is actually located in the Oregon side, in the Walla Valley, um, uh, pardon me, in the Walla Walla AVA, just to my left, uh, across the uh, across the draw. So um, then, the person standing next to Ma uh, uh, Marty is Norm McKibben, and he's nicknamed Storman Norman, and he planted his vineyard in 1989. Uh, he created a, a Pepper Bridge Winery and Ama V Winery. Um, and is regarded as one of uh, the Walla Walla AVAs and wine industry founders for Washington. And then uh, next to Christine, and between Christine and I is Chris Figgins. And he is the son of Gary and Nancy Figgins of Le uh, uh, Leonetti Cellar. And Leonetti Cellar was actually the very first winery to be, uh, to be formed in the Walla Walla AVA. And, um, and uh, you know, they're, they're, as you know, their wines are renowned. That was the very first commercial vineyard. Uh, it was formed in uh, uh, many years ago, 1977. So those are the so what the reason why we're standing together here is because they, as partners, formed a, a group and they started a vineyard called uh, Savain, and uh, and and we're standing on it. And they're the ones who helped us at Willamette Valley plant our very first Bordeaux varietals there in Savain. And so they encouraged us to come. And, uh, and join them. And, and they actually even helped us figure out how we're gonna make wine up there because it's such a long drive from the winery all the way up there. And in the distance, you can see the town of Walla Walla at the very top of your screen. And you'll also see the Seven Hills uh, Vineyard, which is, uh, which is a famous vineyard that they all jointly own together. Next slide. Ah, here we are. There's our shareholders uh, for Willamette Valley Vineyards, and they came out to help us plant Cabernet Sauvignon vines in this new vineyard we call Pambrin. And Pambrin is named after my fourth great grandfather and grandmother, Pierre and, and, and Catherine Pambrin. Um, and he was, uh, Pierre was uh, Walla Walla's first citizen. He was the um, the head of the uh, Hudson's Bay Trading Post, the, the Nez Perce Trading Post uh, here. And, um, and uh, it, back in beginning in, in 1832. So think how long ago that was, 1832. And the reason why the Hudson's Bay had so much success was because his wife, uh, Catherine, my fourth great grandmother was Cree. And so the natives there um, in Walla Walla accepted them uh, because uh, she was a first American like they. Um, and of course, um, uh, but anyway, I just wanted you to know that whenever we do a planning, think about making sure you put this experience on your list because it's a lot of fun. Uh, next slide. Now, you should be starting to enjoy that Mati. And, and maybe what I could do if I could talk Katie into putting up that image on, on your screen, Katie. Okay, here it is. This is Mati. Now, the reason why we created this red blend was to honor uh, Catherine, uh, who they called Kitty, Catherine Pambrin, uh, who was the a partner to Pierre Pambrin at the Hudson's Bay Trading Post, the Nez Pierce Trading Post. Um, the the, um, the Mati um, is the name that was given to the offspring of um, white Caucasian uh, 
principally really Hudson's Bay employees and the natives, the local, the first Americans. And so it was, they, that's where they were called. Those were essentially the, the, uh, the, the mixed um, offspring. And, and what happened in Canada was the Métis actually formed really quite a separate and strong organization and, and, and the culture and political group. Uh, so they were actually quite a force in Canada. And so we wanted to honor them. And so if you look really closely at the image, and I don't know how many of you have the bottle there in front of you that shows the image, but you'll see uh, an image of my fourth uh, great grandmother there um, in the center of the top of this image on each side, the Hudson's, Hudson space stags. And then in the center is the Pambram symbol, the native symbol of the four seasons. Um, now this, this wine was in 16 months in French oak, 38% new oak. And it's, it's, and when you taste this wine, it's like, it's kind of velvety and juicy. Um, and, and what for me in the nose, I get plum, currant, blueberry, and tobacco taste. I get kind of a black cherry, cocoa, um, anise, some dried herbs. Um, I get uh, in the finish, some nice subtle tannins and a really lingering finish. Um, and so for, when I think about pairings, well, you probably know just as well as what would fit your, your uh, taste buds. But for me, short ribs, uh, anything like with wild mushrooms and it's not often you can get a wine like this and enjoy dessert, right? So try a bittersweet chocolate mousse with this wine. Next slide, Katie. Yeah, thank you, Katie, for stopping here. Uh, if we could go back, and I don't know if you can go back just to show this image, just for an, just for a short time, just so that people can see it. This is the other view of of Pambrin Vineyard, and you and so just above the Pambrin Vineyard, Pambrin Vineyard, which is the one we planted together as owners of the winery, is uh, the Figgins Vineyard the, for um, uh, Leonetti Cellar. So that's where Chris and Gary and Nancy own that vineyard right up there. And then to the left on the screen is where the estate Ferguson Vineyard is located. But, and then just to the right is the vineyard owned by Drew Bledsoe, uh, who many of you know is a famous, uh, you know, Patriots uh, quarterback who came to return to the Willamette Valley to his roots to plant a vineyard and make wine called Doubleback. And Drew actually now lives in Bend, Oregon. So he's an Oregonian. Uh, and Chris Figgins uh, got, helped him get his start by helping him plant his vines and make his wine. Um, so these pioneers have really done a lot to grow um, both, to grow the Oregon wine industry. And this next slide is an image of the, 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 one of the newest AVAs in the United States. And I think if you asked Harvey Steinman of the Wine Spectator, editor of the Wine Spectator, what was his, he felt was the most remarkable AVA in the United States, he would say this one. This is called the Rocks District of Milton Freewater. It's a very small district, a very small uh, AVA. It's located wholly within uh, Oregon. And um, if you can go to the next slide, uh, uh, Katie, you can, you can see how unique this vineyard is. Anybody have been to Chateauneuf de Pop, you can kind of go, oh my gosh, this looks familiar. So, you know, Syrah does extremely well in, uh, in this soil. Uh, because it uh, collects the heat during the during the day and then radiates that heat up, as you can see uh, with those vines closely trained to the ground, um, to pr to produce extraordinary Syrahs um, and Rhone varietals from the Rocks District, and we have a vineyard. And so the the Miti wine that you're tasting is not only from the fruit of the Savane, but it's also from the fruit uh, in the Rocks District. Now we haven't got our vines yet producing. We only had well, actually, this year was our first year. But so we got uh, other growers uh, there who, um, uh, uh, you know, helped us get the fruit to make the tea, uh, which is a blend of those uh, two areas. So they're not actually very far apart. Next slide, Katie. Now, um, I wanted to uh, thank my wife, Jan, as you know, many of you know, Jan, She's uh, an amazing uh, person and she has been helping me in, in many, many ways. But one of the things she's doing in this case is she's leading the effort to build the Berno Estate Winery 
uh, just southwest of Dundee off of Highway 99. Now this is gonna be quite unique. This is the very first winery in Oregon exclusively dedicated to the production of Method Champenoise sparkling wine. Um, now, one of the things that people may not realize is that the North Willamette has just the right climatic conditions to do something with Pinot Noir, Pinot Meunier, and Chardonnay that's, that's really extraordinary, just like the Champagne region of France. You know, what, what, what you do when you pick grapes to make sparkling wine is you pick them at lower sugar levels. But what's unique about our climate and soil is that we get uh, aromas and flavors that are developed uh, further along at lower bricks levels, lower sugar levels, because you're picking at 18 and a half bricks. And so that's why I believe you're going to, and others believe, you're going to see some of the world's best method, method champenoise sparkling wines coming from the North Willamette. And we certainly hope from Brno Estate Winery. This uh, garden that you see here that Jan has planned will be all biodynamically farmed just as our vines are. Uh, at this estate. And so we're going to be teaching people what it means to biodynamically farm and why biodynamic farming uh, wine grapes produces such extraordinary results in the wine. Uh, next slide, uh, Katie. There it is. Uh, it's under construction. And um, actually, Jan's there, uh, you know, on a lot, a lot, just making sure that all this is coming together well. You know, we did have, for those of you who are owners, you know, we had to take a, a, a pause because of the pandemic, but we're now we're back on track. Um, and uh, so we expect this to be open to all of you uh, in, in the uh, growing season of 2022. Uh, we're doing a lot of things here. This is a big project. Jan's even widening Highway 99. She had to work with the Department of Transportation to uh, get them to agree to widen Highway 99 and put a turning lane in. So we'll be the only winery in Oregon that will have a turning lane into it from a major highway. Pretty funny. So this, uh, but because our owners uh, have special privileges, of course, they'll have the opportunity to reserve and use the ownership spaces in this winery. Uh, next slide, Katie. Now I did have talked about my owners a lot. And of course, you know, you are, I know a number of AWS members are owners as well. We now have now 19,000 wine enthusiast owners. We're actually doing a preferred stock offering to help finish the construction uh, uh, of, uh, of Brno Estate. And uh, so we're raising, we raised, uh, uh, we're raising $9.3 million to do that, but also to help tell, take the Oregon wine story on the road. And so you'll puzzle and think, well, what is that? So I hope to get an answer some of that uh, uh, from you uh, uh, here just at the end of this presentation. But you can also see we have uh, 7,420 wine club members. Now there's a little bit of crossover between our wine enthusiast owners and our wine club members, but our wine enthusiast owners have a special privilege. And that is, is that they are able to buy any of the wines even down to one bottle at 25% off. And so I've had, I've had many of my shareholders tell me that, Jim, they say to me that they say, this is the, 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 the only in stock I own, the only investment I own where I can drink myself to profitability. So um, it, if, you're a, if you're a wine enthusiast, you might as well own the winery and receive the benefits of ownership. So uh, something to consider. The, the, the preferred stock offering that we're doing is almost complete. There's just a little bit of shares left. Um, so we believe it'll close out certainly before the end of the year. Uh, we've sold, I think, over 8.3 million. So there's probably about a million dollars worth of shares remaining. And this stock is traded on the NASDAQ. It's, um, it's uh, WVIP, but uh, it's actually trading for more than we're selling the shares for. We're selling the shares for directly from the winery. And uh, there's a place on the website where you can, you can learn about that and request information and, and, and then study it to see if that it suits you. Uh, next slide, Katie. Now, I wanted just to stop here and just make sure I was getting, um, I was answering some of your questions. Uh, one of the questions you asked was um, about Jory soils. And, and these soils are, and I, and I hope I get to take a little, tell you a little story because uh, this, uh, and this is actually a story that's not really that well known. So you get a kick, a kick out of it. 
Um, you know, Jory soil is soil that comes from essentially decayed volcanic flow, which is called basalt. And the way the Willamette Valley got basalt in it was like 26 or more million years ago, the earth opened up near Idaho, near between Oregon and Idaho, just kind of at the foot of the Blue Mountains and, and fissures in the earth you know, allowed this lava to flow out of the ground. And the only place that lava had to go was downhill. And so it followed the Columbia River drainage there. So they're called Columbia River flood basalts. So the lava followed the Columbia River drainage to the Pacific. And, and then of course, of course, filled up the, the river bottom as well in the process. Well, that uh, lava forms these hillsides in the Willamette Valley. So if you come to the estate winery just south of Salem, uh, we're on a lava flow from Eastern Oregon that were, and right underneath your feet was the ancient path 26 million years ago of the Columbia River. And so the Columbia River kept getting pushed further and further north as these flood basalts flooded into the Willamette Valley. And then of course they decayed and, and they produce these amazing Jory soils. Now the name Jory is named after a pioneer family that came you know, across on the Oregon Trail, one of the first uh, native, you know, first Oregonians to arrive in Oregon um, who were, uh, you know, who were, um, uh, you know, the part of that movement, that migration. And, and so it was named, that soil is named after them. So the question is, well, how did, on earth did this soil become the state soil if it's really, there's not really that much of it? Well, what happened was uh, some, uh, like my college professors, again, here you go. Uh, there was a university professor that led the effort, uh, Scott Burns from Portland State University. He's a geologist, teach geology, and he was so convinced that this soil needed special recognition. He asked the Oregon legislature to name it the state soil. And of course, as you can what, imagine, he ran into a buzzsaw, right? Because there were all these other legislators from other parts of Oregon that said, hey, we've got soil too that's, that's famous and it's important. Why should Jory be the state soil? And so he actually, his bill actually failed in the Oregon legislature. So the next uh, uh, reset or the next uh, biennial period, he, uh, uh, he and his fellow geologists and Oregon winemakers went and talked to lawmakers. And the way that Scott Burns got the vote to eventually pass a bill to make Jory the state soil was he convinced those Eastern Oregon legislators that they should vote for his bill because that's where the soil originated from, the, the lava flows of Eastern Oregon. So I thought you'd enjoy that as a, as a great, as a fun story. Um, there's another story about Jory and about Willamette Valley vineyards. And, and one of the things that... Um, that might, you know, you, you kind of think about, well, just how long ago was this and where are some of the oldest soils in the valley? And the, and, and actually they're in the Salem Hills where Willamette Valley Vineyards is located. And the way we know that that is the oldest flow that came into the Willamette Valley is because of Nazi U-boat captains. So here's kind of the Paul Harvey rest of the story about this Jory soil. What happened was during World War II, uh, the United States was, uh, you know, needed a lot of aluminum. And we don't have, the United States at that time had no native or domestic source of alumina to make aluminum. And so they imported it from uh, British Guiana and it came across the Gulf of Mexico on ships. And so the, the Nazi U-boat captains would, would hang out in the Gulf of Mexico and they would sink those ore ships that were coming across the Gulf uh, to uh, the continental United States. And so the military put out a, a, a call and they said, look, we need to make more aluminum bombers and fighters. Um, we need aluminum. And so they asked all the college professors in geology to go and look for bauxite. And because and, bauxite is formed in the soil of these ancient basalts. And they, they found a huge supply of bauxite, this this rock that is formed in the soil made of ferrous oxide, you know, uh, alumina, titanium and zirconium uh, over the millennia uh, through the interaction of the electrical uh, charges in the soil. And, and uh, they found it in the Salem Hills. And so Reynolds Metals, Reynolds, Reynolds Aluminum came and bought all the hillsides, all the top of the hillsides 
of, uh, of um, uh, South Salem Hills and then sat on it, hoping someday they would be able to harvest all that wonderful bauxite. Well, fortunately, the war ended and, um, and uh, they didn't have to mine the bauxite and all take all the topsoil in the, of all those hills that, where we live. And, and that's when the Reynolds Medals met the, even a more formidable opponent, Oregon environmentalists that would not allow them to mine that bauxite. And so now all of those hillsides are being planted in Pinot Noir. How about that for a story? Um, okay, what does it mean to have 25% uh, new oak in a wine? What this means is when we put uh, the wine in barrel, we put it in, we can't put it all in all new oak because you're, you'd have way too much oak influence in the wine. And so what we do is we use sometimes two-year-old and three-year-old barrels that have been used, you know, two to three years, or sometimes even a four-year-old barrel, which we would then would call neutral or oak. In other words, it, had, it would part very little effect into the wine. And, um, uh, and so um, I just wanted to kind of make sure I answer that question. I was just looking at the chat screen and Diana was telling me, hey, I got to stop you pretty soon. Um, Okay, uh, what, one of the questions I had from David Sass was what uh, French terroirs would be compared with these wines. I would say the, the Chardonnay, think about a Merceau in uh, south of uh, Bone in Burgundy as a place that would be probably the most likely. You close your eyes, you probably even imagine looking at the little town of Merceau south of Bone. For the Tualatin Estate Pinot Noir, I think, you know, the Cote d'Or, I think in, in Burgundy would be a, a, you know, something in it that you could think of that would be like it. And for the Mati, you know, the Mati is an unusual blend, right? And, the, and, the, and so because it includes both um, uh, Bordeaux and Rhone varietals in its blend. And so I would say pretty hard to make a French connection there. But if you were thinking about how they use Grenache in the Southern part of Rhone, you might, might, might think of a comparison uh, to uh, the Southern part of Rhone. Uh, let's see, what else have I got for questions? Um, oh, yes. Oh, my gosh. And I hope you don't cut me off too soon because I got to tell you about this. Thank you for asking this question. Um, here's the question. Tell me about the fires. So, as you know, uh, we were, um, we, in 2018, we went to the rescue of the Rogue Valley growers who had their contracts canceled by a company called Copper Cane that makes a wine in California called Eluan. They call it Oregon Pinot Noir, but the wine's actually made in California called Eluan. And, uh, and, and of course, they have been uh, using uh, Oregon AVAs illegally, and the federal government has definitely done something about that. But anyway, they, they, they canceled those contracts and left those Rogue Valley growers hanging. Uh, and, and you know what that means. These growers would, would uh, had really no option. Only a few days before harvest, they really couldn't have found another buyer. So what or Willamette Valley winemakers did was we banded together to help them. And we paid them the full price for their fruit. And then we went and made a wine and we sold it called Oregon Solidarity. We gave the Rogue Valley vintners the, the net proceeds of the sale of that wine to help them. And so, as you know, you heard from Aaron how, uh, you know, the Oregon Solidarity Project was honored and received one of the Wine Star Awards, which is kind of like one of the, the Nobel Prizes of our industry. Um, and we received that award by the Wine Enthusiast Organization. Well, this year, um, we had a very unusual, like a hundred year event, a 50 to 80 mile east wind uh, uh, blew a small lightning fire in the Cascades into a horrific wildfire and blew it west. And that smoke then blew into the Willamette Valley. So the Willamette Valley for the first time uh, received uh, smoke this year uh, that we hadn't ever had to deal with before. Now, a lot of people panicked because uh, they weren't, you know, they didn't think that those California wineries panicked, of course, and they canceled their contracts again. So we have 20 wine, uh, 20 growers that we support annually in, in our cellars uh, buying their fruit. Well, we took in 22 more growers who had had their contracts canceled and didn't have insurance to cover their losses. And so that's how we tried to help them. And their fruit was absolutely beautiful. Um, the, there were just a, only a few spots that were smoke affected. 
And, and so let me, if I can, just tell you a little bit of background on this for those who want to know a little bit of the details about how does smoke affect fruit. Well, in smoke uh, from a forest fire are organic, organic compounds. And these organic compounds are called like guaiacol is one of them, methyl guaiacol is another, cresol is another. Those are the three organic compounds. But glycol is really the predominant one that influences the taste of wine and the aroma of wine. Well, you get guaiacol out of a barrel when you age wine. So when you have a red wine that's got a little bit of smokiness to it, um, that is guaiacol. Uh, whiskey, for example, you'll taste it there. Uh, people who have roasted coffee has guaiacol in it. But the real problem, of course, is how much, right? And what glycol can do in smoke, especially if it's French fresh smoke, is that can, it can penetrate that, um, that waxy surface of the grape skin. And as you know, Pinot Noir is a thin skin. Um, and it can then bind itself up, the guaiacol can bind itself up with the formation of sugar, uh, you know, sugar molecules in the grape as it's ripening. And so you don't really taste it until you ferment it. And because you, by fermenting it, you, you, know, you, you, create the, you turn the sugar into uh, alcohol and CO2, and then that gets, that releases the guaiacol so you can smell it. And so what we did was we went out and did 43 test ferments of these lots of this fruit we brought in to make sure that it was good. And we did find three of those ferments were affected, but the rest were beautiful. So um, that's the story, so don't panic over that 2020 vintage. It might be one of the only really nice things that came out of the 2020 vintage when you think about this year. Um, so I hope you look forward to, um, to enjoying that wine when we release it. Um, now I'm told that I'm just got a few minutes left. So let's take a look here at your questions. I sure wish I could see you and hear from you directly. Uh, one of the questions Eva Gallagher asked is, did we find seashells in our soils? Oh, Eva, I love this question. Here's where I found it. You saw the picture of the uh, construction that Jan is doing at uh, Brno Estate, building that Method Champion was a sparkling wine facility. I found rocks there from Canada, the white granite rocks. So those are called glacial erratics from the great flood. And I've saved them so I can show you when you come, I'll have them there. But the other thing I found was I found a, uh, a rock that had the imprint of a seashell in it. And so what happened was the, 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 the bottom of the, you know, Oregon was really underwater millions and millions of years ago and it got lifted up out of the ocean. And so we have uh, uh, marine soils in some of our vineyards. And so this particular vineyard had a base of marine soil. So that seashell showed in that rock. And then it was overlaid by these flood waters, these flood soils that came in from the Missoula Lake flood. And then it also has in its profile, and you can see the color of the soil there, it also has in its profile, the volcanic soils of the Dundee Hill. So it has actually all three soils in this vineyard. So it's really quite unique. Anyway, great, great question. Thank you for reminding, I, I was actually gonna tell that story even if you didn't ask the question, Eva, but I'm glad you did. So I think, I hope that's it. I wanna tell you, um, I greatly appreciate you signing on to this presentation. I look forward to seeing you all again in person and appreciate the support that you as members are giving to support the AWS and tell the story of wine, but also of course, the important story of Oregon wine. So I'll finish with this. And this is, Jim, what are you doing with that extra money you're raising from that public offering? And here's what we're doing. We're building outposts, winery outposts in other states. I'd love your help to build one in your state. And we built one in Folsom, California. We've got more planned. We want to take the Oregon wine story on the road. So I'd love to have your help. Thank you so much, Jim. Uh, we are getting all sorts of wonderful, great presentations, great wines. Can't wait to see you. Excellent. Um, we really appreciate your time today. This presentation is uh, being recorded and will be available on YouTube Live um, on the AWS YouTube page. Also, the information on ordering the wine is in the chat. And, um, you know, just thank you. We will be in Washington in 2022. And so I already hit Jan up to put that on your calendar because we're coming to the West Coast and we'd love to be able to 
uh, coordinate something with you. Absolutely. We we'll, we're going to roll out the red carpet. We're going to get you as many of you over to Walla Walla and down to the winery as possible. That sounds fantastic, Jim. Thank you again for your time. Thank you. Thank you, AWS. And have a wonderful day, Jim. Thank you. For the rest of you, the next session starts at four o'clock Eastern time. So I will see you then.